We're in uh, Luke chapter 9, if you would turn there with me this morning. Luke 9. I'm going to read beginning in verse 18. It says, Now it happened that as Jesus was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? And he answered, and they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah, and others that one of the prophets of old has risen. Then he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Christ of God. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. I want us to join together in just a word of prayer before we look at this passage, but I'd like to ask uh, I, I, all of those who are volunteering in the VBS this week, would you stand if you're, uh, if you're one of the people that's going to be working in that? I know some of them are upstairs already with the uh, children this morning, but I know Carla has a group of about, list of about 40 that she showed me the other day. Fantastic response. And I know that some of you may not be volunteering or buying uh, food and other things out here to support. And so let's just uh, raise these, these folks as well as our service this morning to the Lord in prayer once more. Thank you, Father, for these who are giving of their time and effort to make your word known to these young lives. Lord, our prayer is that, as always, um, we know there's this, there's this combination of what we do and what you do, but you're the one who has to do the heart work. And so we're praying that you will take the efforts that we expend and that these folks who will be volunteering this week expend, thanking you so much for each one of them, but that you will multiply their efforts, that your Holy Spirit will take them, make them valuable, and use them in the lives of these young people. So thankful, Father, for the many children that you are bringing. I think uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 already signed up, and maybe as many as 80 we expect may be here. And Lord, help us to remember them in prayer during the week and uh, be faithfully supporting that effort. Same with Jesse and Kelly as they change uh, jobs here. It doesn't affect their, uh, the way they help us here at the church, but will affect what they're doing the rest of the time. And we pray that your blessing will be on, on their life and that you will also fill in the remainder of what they need as far as support is concerned. Father, we pray above all now that you will open your word to us this morning. Help us to understand it, perhaps in a way we never have, and that we would be not just hearers, but doers of the word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all, and you may be seated. We, uh, we've begun to look at this passage. Uh, we're actually third sermon this week on this a uh, little section of Scripture, but it's a wonderful section. Um, this morning, I kind of want to introduce what we're going to talk about, the necessity of the cross, by telling you this little story about a mother who was introducing her five-year-old daughter to a friend. A friend hadn't met the little girl yet, and so she said, uh, this is my, I'd like, to, I'd like you to meet my daughter, Alexis. And the friend said, Alexis, oh, what a, what a beautiful name. Why did you call her Alexis? And the lady said, well, because if I hadn't had her, that's what I'd be driving. <laughs> so, <clears throat> you, you get the point that everything worthwhile comes at a price, right? There's a price to be paid. There are no free lunches to use another Cliche, And so I think it's no surprise that the thing that is most worth having in all the world, forgiveness from the guilt and from the power of sin, comes at a high price, comes at really the highest price. As we've been through this passage, we've been looking at the price to the Father in the first week, how he had to give his own son and was pleased to crush him in the words of Isaiah 53 verse 10 something we can hardly get our arms around. And now we've begun to look at the price to the sun, and then we will look in the weeks to follow at the price to us. But the price to the sun is laid out here. Now in verse 20, Peter has made this great confession, right? And he said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. 
warms Jesus' heart to hear that. And yet at the same time, Jesus is well aware that the, that the definition of this, that the disciples would put on this word Messiah is desperately short-sighted. To them, Messiah meant immediate, instant, political deliverer. They got that part of it. And in fact, that is part of who the Messiah is as, as revealed in the Old Testament, right? But, what, but they were clueless about the cost that was going to attach to that. Clueless because they had ignored some parts of the Old Testament. And so the disciples were absolutely stunned when on the heels of this great confession by Peter, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Jesus turned to him and said, right on, Peter, that's exactly who I am. But the next step in the process is that I have to go to Jerusalem to suffer, to be rejected, to die, and then to rise again. And I mean, the air went out of the balloon. They didn't understand the die part, so they certainly didn't understand the rise again part, but they have to understand. If they're gonna become the representatives of Jesus in the church that's gonna follow, they have to understand that be before the crown comes the cross. And so we started last week to look at these four infinitives at the end of verse 22 that describe what has to happen, the price to the son, and we looked at the fact that, first of all, he has to suffer. And we saw that that's not just the cross, although obviously that's a big part of it, but that through all of his life, Jesus suffered in order to prepare him to be able to obey the final and great request of the Father to go to the cross. Remember, we looked at Hebrews 5.8 and saw how that he learned obedience through suffering so that he could so they'd be willing to go and do what the Father has asked him to do. But now we want to look at the other three today, beginning with that second one there, the word rejection. He has to be rejected. Being rejected isn't much fun, is it? Some, most of us have been there at some time or other, so we have some idea what rejection is like. And it wasn't fun for Jesus either, but the interesting thing to observe here is that he ran right into it. We're told in Matthew 16, parallel account of this, Matthew 16, verse 21, it says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Jesus must go to Jerusalem. He's walking right into the hands of his bitterest enemies. Most of us, probably if we knew that we were number one on the most wanted list, would head for the hills, right? That would be our tendency to get out of the way, to, make, to delay whatever the inevitable was as long as possible and hope that perhaps they'd lose interest before they could find us. But not Jesus. He does exactly the opposite. He intentionally, you have to understand, beloved, he intentionally and purposefully takes himself to Jerusalem. He turns himself over to his enemies. He tells his disciples in Luke 13, verse 33, he says, nevertheless, I must... It's that little Greek word, day again, D-E-I. It is necessary. It's absolutely set in concrete. This must happen. I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Try to think, how can I help you get a feel for this? And I thought, well, think about General Eisenhower. You know, after he's demonstrated his, his superiority on, on D-Day and the landings have been successful and now it's just a matter of time and everybody knows it before the Allied forces can sweep over Europe and take over Germany. Having demonstrated that, suppose he says to his driver as he arrives on the shores of France one day, let's go to Berlin, I've got to capitulate to Hitler. That's what Jesus is doing here, beloved. He's... He's already demonstrated he has power to do whatever he wants to, has he not? We've seen that all the way through the book of Luke. And yet what he's going to do now is he's going to turn off the power, if I can use the phrase that way. He's going to turn off the power and he's going to Jerusalem to put himself into the hands of his most bitter enemies. Believe me, he didn't do that for his sake. He did that for our sake, right? 
He's going to Jerusalem. Now we should talk for just a moment about who these elders and chief priests and scribes are that are going to reject him. Who are they? Elders are the national leaders. Most of them have been leaders in a regional area, and then they have been sent to Jerusalem to be part of the national group of leaders there. They have authority as judges. You might, I kind of think of them as some combination of a Supreme Court and our legislative bodies, because they had that kind of power. And here are some of the highest of them in Jerusalem. The high priests are obviously the religious leaders, and the scribes are those who are educated and well-versed in the Old Testament law and all of the traditions which have built up around that in terms of, the, of Judaism as a religious and political entity because it was both. Now, there was some combination of high priests and elders and scribes who made up a 71-member group called the Sanhedrin. Most of you have studied the Bible, the New Testament, are aware of this group called the Sanhedrin. It's mentioned occasionally. And they're the ones who had the final say about things that were going to go on in the nation of Israel, apart from, obviously, Rome is over them at this point in time. So they rule under the authority of Rome, but the Sanhedrin is the one who makes the rules with approval by Rome in the nation of Israel. This group, this group, beloved, of all the people in Israel, because of the knowledge they had, because of the background they had in the Old Testament scriptures, because of the advantages that they had, this should have been the group that was the first to recognize the legitimacy of Jesus as the Messiah. These should have been the ones who were embracing him and advertising him and making sure that he was known far away, far and wide in the nation of Israel. And instead, they're going to be the ones who officially reject him on behalf of the nation. This is the Sanhedrin. This is who the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes are. Now, the word reject here is a word which means to discard something after submitting it to a test, to, to declare it unworthy. It was used, for example, for counterfeit money. It, 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 it's an official opinion Something is unworthy based on examination. So what's, what Jesus is announcing here is what's about to happen in Jerusalem is, think about it, the most worthy man who ever walked the face of the earth is about to be declared unworthy by this group of elite rulers in Israel. You know, in one sense, you could say this is human wisdom at its best. Whenever you feel a little bit intimidated or cowed by human wisdom, just remember where it tends to lead. Human wisdom got it as wrong as it can possibly be gotten in the case of Jesus. But he's going to be rejected. They discounted Jesus like a cheap counterfeit. Peter had just proclaimed, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And the rulers in Jerusalem are going to say, we officially reject you. While well, some individuals did accept Christ while he was here on earth, the nation as a whole officially rejected him. Now, to understand what this rejection is really all about, we're going to we're gonna have to dig a little, so you're going to have to put on your thinking cap for a little bit here. We have to do a little history and a little theology. Jesus' rejection is for a specific purpose, and the, the reason he, he, he puts that word in here is to emphasize something. What Luke wants us to understand is that the rejection of Jesus symbolizes the fact that salvation is always by grace alone. That's a message that resonates throughout the Bible, but here's one more instance in which we see it. And let me show you how we see it. Follow me closely as we go through this. Israel began as a nation around 2000 B.C., it was about that time that God looked out upon the world that he had created and the creation and where they had gone by that time, and all he saw was a world gone mad with evil. You remember, may remember he'd seen something similar in the time of Noah a few years before, which time he instituted the flood to basically start over. 
But now mankind in the next few hundred years has still managed to arrive at a very similar position, but this time God's promised not to destroy the world by water at least again. So he does something different. He goes out and he chooses a man named Abraham. He's, Abraham's just another pagan. He's like the rest of the world at this time as God looked out there on, on Egypt and on Syria and, and on Canaan and all the rest of the lands. All he saw was a perversion of his first revelation, the revelation of a true and only God, perverted into idolatrous, polytheistic systems of worship. By the way, a side note here, most anthropologists, uh, as little as 30, 40 years ago, believed that monotheism, the belief and the worship of one God, was really just kind of an upgrade from polytheism in pagan cultures that came along before. Most anthropologists today, because of new information that they've been able to bring to light, believe that polytheism was a perversion of monotheism, which was first, which is exactly the way the Bible has it. That's what God was seeing. And so he took a man that was in this polytheistic tradition in the land of Chaldea, he moved him to Canaan, and he promised him that he was going to give him great blessing, that he was going to give him land, that he was going to give him descendants, that he was going to make his name great, and that his people would be a blessing to the, all the other nations. This was the promise that God made to Abraham. So here's the question. What did Abraham do to deserve that God pick him out of the whole world to do this? And the answer is absolutely nothing. He did nothing, beloved. The only thing that Abraham did was According to Genesis 15, 6, when God made the promise to him, Abraham was smart enough to believe it. And God says Abraham believed God and God counted that to him for righteousness. It wasn't any merit of anything he did. It wasn't because he was so good. It wasn't because he was better than the rest of them. He was just like the rest of them. But God chose him. And God gave him this great covenant that we call the Abrahamic covenant. That was God's promise to Abraham. You'll find it in Genesis 12, Genesis 15, 17, 20, 22. It's several times in the Bible. Look particularly at Genesis 15 because there God goes to great pains to demonstrate that this covenant is unconditional. What does unconditional mean? That means God is saying, I'm going to do this, Abraham, whether you and your descendants follow me or not whether you get it right or not, this is what I am going to do. It's an unconditional covenant. It's a promise to do something regardless of what the other person does. And so Abraham has this covenant. Now, fast forward 400 years. Abraham's descendants have ended up in Egypt. You read about it in Exodus and the end of Genesis. We don't know how that all happened. But they'd been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. So God sends them another great leader, Moses, to deliver them, to bring deliverance. And after, 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 it's a critical point, won't, won't major on it today, but after they're saved from Egypt, after they're delivered, he gives them the law. That tells you something right away. The law wasn't given in order to save them, it was given to tell them how to live after they've been delivered. And it's given for another reason, which is to show succeeding generations their need for salvation. That they spiritually need to come to God. And included in the law is the sacrificial system. You'll remember whereby not only do we have the Ten Commandments, but because you can't keep them, here's the sacrificial system by which you can come and bring goats and lambs and other things and sacrifice them. Not because their blood can take away your sin, but because they look forward to a greater and ultimate sacrifice who will come one day who can pay for your sins. So you can have forgiveness on credit under this system that we call the Mosaic Covenant. The Mosaic Covenant. So we have two great covenants. They're not the only ones in the Old Testament, but two great covenants. Now, fast forward to a few weeks in the future of Jesus when he's going to stand before the Sanhedrin as the promised Messiah, as the one who now is the 
perfect keeper of the Mosaic law, as the one who is the ultimate sacrifice for sin that was prefigured when Abraham was told to go out and sacrifice his sin and then God saved him, remember? That one, all of those things wrapped up in the person of Jesus is gonna stand before the leaders of the nation of Israel and instead of embracing him, they're gonna charge him with blasphemy and kill him. They declare him worthless. In rejecting Jesus, think about this, they have effectively rejected 2,000 years of preparation by God. Turned it down. Didn't understand what this was all about, but that's what they did. The, na the nation, by this official act, demonstrated that they were unworthy of salvation. They demonstrated not only were they no better than the surrounding nations that they considered far below them in terms of spiritual value, they, they were actually demonstrating that they were worse because they had far more advantages than those other nations did, and yet they're turning down their own Savior. The nation of Israel has committed spiritual suicide when that act happens. So, so God is done with Israel, right? That's it for them. So now we, those who are believers today, are the spiritual, spiritual Israel. We've been grafted in. We've been, we've, we've been able to claim the promises spiritually that God gave to Abraham. And God is done with Israel as a nation, right? Oh, no. No, no, no. Well, this is where we, this is where we part company with our dear, and I, and I mean this sincerely with our dear, our millennial friends. God is not done with Israel. God is not even close to done with Israel. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, but let me give you the one overwhelming, overriding reason, and it's this, that God made a promise to Abraham in Genesis 15 that was unconditional, and God is not going to break his promise. God doesn't break his promises. So you have to start there. If you're going to say Israel is done and over with and God's not going to deal with them as a nation anymore, that's the first thing you have to explain. Well, what was Genesis 15 all about? But now let me give you a few other passages in the New Testament to show you that God still has a future for Israel. Follow with me as we look at some of these. Turn first to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And don't worry, I'll get to why this is also important before I get done. Okay, Galatians chapter 3. In Galatians 3, Paul is going through an explanation of the gospel, how, the God, how, how law and the gospel relate to each other. And he says this in Galatians 3, beginning in verse 17. Galatians 3, verse 17. He says, this is what I mean. The law which came 430 years afterward, and Paul there means that the law came 430 years after the promise to Abraham, so like we just discussed. The law, which came 430 years afterwards, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. So he said, okay, so you have the law here, and here's the Mosaic law, and the nation of Israel has totally messed that up, but that cannot annul the promise. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, in other words, if salvation is by keeping the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So Paul is saying, listen, if Israel is going to be saved by keeping the Mosaic law. They're dead. They're gone. It's all over with. If salvation is by being good, Israel is done for. But it's not. Salvation is on the basis of promise. The Mosaic law never nullified the promise that God had given to Abraham 430 years earlier. God keeps his promises. Now, consider that kind of a baseline passage, turn back to Romans. And even though Romans, you've got to turn back two or three books to get there, even though Romans comes in your Bible before Galatians, it's written after Galatians. It's 
written a little bit later than Galatians, and Paul goes into more detail about this issue of Israel. So let's go back to Romans chapter 9. Romans 9. And verse 31, he says in verse 31 of Romans 9, but that Israel who pursued law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. In other words, what he's saying is Israel decided to pursue righteousness by being good. They thought keeping the law is the way to get saved. That was what they had come to believe He says, then, if that's the case, Israel certainly failed under the Mosaic law. But he says, why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. Now, do you see that that perfectly described Israel at the time of Christ? They had determined that the way to be saved, that the way to get right with God was to keep the law. And when they found out they couldn't keep the law, they built traditions around the law. They defined a law for themselves in such a way that they felt they could keep it and then declared themselves righteous. But you can't do that. That's against the rules. We don't get to make the rules. They totally misunderstood. God had been saying all along, listen, this is by faith. That's what he meant when he said about Abraham. Abraham believed God. He counted that to him for righteousness. Israel, by that time Christ had come, had become so totally lost and devastated in legalism, they couldn't see the answer to their problem when he was standing right in front of them. But it was just, it was just the culmination of where they had been going for hundreds of years. Now we're still not done. Turn to Romans 10, verse 1. Romans 10, verse 1. You should be right there. Brothers, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer for God, for them, is that they may be saved. Is he just talking when he mentions Israel there? Is he just talking about spiritual Israel, those of us who have, who have been grafted into the, to the promises of Abraham, which we have? But is that all he's talking about? It's not possible. He's talking about the nation. He's talking about ethnic Israel there. Go down to chapter 11, verse 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. God's not done with Israel. Look at chapter 11, verses 25, starting in verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, which if you study hard enough, and I won't point you to it this morning, but Jesus talks about the fullness of the Gentiles in Luke. We'll get there. He says, until that happens, there's this hardening in Israel, and in this way all Israel will be saved as it is, ri- as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Is there a future for Israel? Absolutely. You can't miss it. God still has a purpose and a plan for Israel. Has he set them aside for 2,000 years so far and, and, and let them come into persecution and, and, and into dispersion as a nation and all the rest of it? Absolutely. But has he reestablished them as a nation on May 16, 1948? Do you know of any nations named the Hittites or the Moabites or the Hivites or the Hittites? See any of them around? They're all gone. But who's back in the land of Israel as a nation? Israel. God has a future for Israel, beloved. Israel's alive, and one day they will be well. There's more to come. There's Revelation 6 through 19 to come before Israel will finally turn to God. But here's what Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10 says. Don't, don't need to look at it. Let me just read it for you, but you might want to note it. Zechariah 12, 10. God says this through Zechariah. He says, I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Listen, 
Israel's first century rejection will one day be overturned by a generation that will come to Christ in mass. We will see that nation of Israel turn to the Christ that they've rejected. Why will that happen? Because they deserve it? Because they merited it? Because they earned it in some way? No. It will happen because God made a promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago and he's going to fulfill it. That's why. Salvation is by grace from start to finish. It feels like we're smart enough and wise enough to one day make a decision to come to Christ. But the Bible's position on all of that is no one would come to Christ except he calls them. The rejection of Christ by Israel is intended to show us that given every human opportunity and every human advantage, man will still reject his Savior unless there's divine intervention. And that's exactly why Jesus says in John 6, verse 44, no one, no one can come to me except the Father who sent me draws him or her. We have to be drawn by the Father. It's a matter of grace. It's a pure matter of God choosing. Ephesians 1 tells us that those who are believers, those of us who have come to faith in Christ are those who are chosen before the foundation of the world, predestined to adoption, redeemed. I like how Spurgeon says it. He says, you know, it's a good thing God chose me before the foundation of the world because if he chose me after I was born, he never would have chose me. He's <laughs> a man who recognized his own sin. Wonderful thing to be chosen by God. But listen, now listen carefully. Because always... In the Bible, when you find the predestination and the election of God and the choosing of God, you find human responsibility right beside it. And in that John 6, where it says, if anyone, anyone, no one can come to me except the Father draws him, go back to chapter 5, verse 24, and here's what you'll read. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life, human responsibility. How do you put those two together? I don't know. God does. I just know I can't do anything about God's part, but I can do something about my part. Have you believed in him? It says, he who believes in him should not come into judgment, but has already passed from death to life. The grace of God, beloved, is a wonderful thing. That's the promise to all who believe, and his promises never fail. Once chosen, Israel couldn't get out of God's hand if they wanted to. Yeah, generations of them will, but in the end, God's going to redeem that nation. He's going to rule that nation. He's going to rule the world from that nation because his promises never fail. That's what the rejection of Jesus shows us. How about the third thing, the death? The death of Christ. We're back in Luke 9 now. Luke 9. Son of man must suffer many things, verse 22, and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. Jesus must be killed. The Bible's position on that is either we pay for our own sin or, or Jesus pays for our sin. It's got to be one or the other. But, but, we live in a day and in a time when most modern thought, even in most churches, the vast majority of churches do not believe that, they reject that view. Man hates the idea of penal substitution because it implies accountability. And so we like to throw it over. And so we insist that, well, Jesus died because of bad politics. He was the victim of an unfortunate accident here. He's, he was killed for championing the cause of the disenfranchised. The political powers feel that he would mount an insurrection, and so they put him to death. It was kind of nice that in his death, he showed us, he gave us a great example of how to love our enemies, so in the end, he kind of wins. He sort of wins, 
shows us, shows us how to love our enemies even as he dies. And then he's kind of, you know, spiritually, that spirit pervades, you know, and so are you feeling amorphous here? Feeling like you don't know what reality is? But that's what we're being taught. This view was found, you know, really, I couldn't have said it better, in a Tribune column, July 10, 2010. Here's what a local pastor wrote. He said, was Jesus' death on the cross a divine necessity? The Bible itself is at best ambiguous when it comes to answering the question of the divine necessity of Jesus' death. Did we just read it this morning? I must go to Jerusalem. <laughs> Sorry, I get excited about this. <laughs> An honest reading of the Bible can only lead us to the conclusion that the Bible is uncertain on the significance of Jesus' death. When did you last read the Bible? From cover to cover, that's all it's about. This writer concedes that some believe Jesus died for sinners, but he rejects that view out of hand. Because why? Because, quote, it turns God into a child abuser, one who requires the death of his slash her only son. In a world infatuated with the idea of empire, there can be little question as to why Jesus was tortured and crucified. He was killed by the state because his way of life was hazardous to the continuation of the empire. Believe me, beloved, that's a blasphemous lie. You only have to read the Gospels to see that Jesus was killed for claiming to be God. He pushed that issue, and he pushed it on purpose. And may I remind you that the representatives of the empire, Herod and Pilate, both declared Jesus innocent and wanted to release him. All you got to do is read the Bible. It's not even a matter of interpretation. It's just simply there. They wanted to release him. It was the Jewish contingent who pushed the issue and said, we're going to report you guys to Caesar if you don't you don't conform to our desires in this case and kill him. So from a human perspective, Jesus was killed because he truthfully claimed to be God and the Jewish people absolutely rejected that claim. That's why he was killed. That's from a human perspective. Now from God's perspective, it was a whole different deal. The father was pleased to crush him. Why? so that a lost race of humankind could have a chance at salvation. That's why. Jesus said he must be killed. It's not a tragedy. It's a necessity. It's a necessity if we are ever going to be saved. The Bible is unambiguous on this point, contrary to the comments of that man. Let me just read a few passages. You jot them down if you'd like to check them later. Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 4. Jesse read some of this this morning. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now, keep in mind, this is written 700 years ahead of the time of Christ, and it describes almost precisely the death of Christ. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, not the Romans and not the Jews, but by God. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced, why? For our transgressions. He was crushed, why? For our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that was, has brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. This is not social he healing, spiritual healing, from, uh, spiritual healing from iniquities that he's talking about. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Listen, this wasn't a political death. This wasn't because he was serving the cause of the disenfranchised, although he was doing all of that stuff. This was strictly because he claimed to be God. And he allowed it to happen. He planned it to happen. He purposefully went to this to happen because he knew it was the only way to pay for your sins and mine. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
The Bible is not an ambigu uh, ambiguous on this issue. Jesus told his disciples the night before he died when he, by the way, could still have avoided that death. He told them, drink this cup, drink, drink it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. No death, no forgiveness. Why did he die? As a martyr for the oppressed? To show us how to love our enemies? Be a great example? He died for one reason, beloved, and that was it to pay for the price for our sins. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Peter, after Christ had died, been resurrected, went back to the Father. Peter and all of his Apostle friends did not go around fomenting insurrection against the empire, as though that was the continuation of Jesus' purpose. What did they do? They preached repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1.19 that we are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without spot, or blemish. And he adds in 1 Peter 2.24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? To provide a great example to be a martyr? No, he bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Are you getting the picture? Jesus died for our sins. It's the only way to pay for them. They had to be paid for point is Jesus had to die for one reason to pay for your sins and mine the whole trinity hates sin more than anything it violates the character of God but rather listen now rather than destroy the sinners which would have been God's right to do rather than destroy the sinners God the father destroyed his son so that he could forgive the sinners Jesus had to die. It's a must because it's the only way for salvation for us. And just as he must go to Jerusalem, beloved, we must go to the cross if we're ever going to be saved. Let's take advantage of the provision that's been made there. Oswald Chambers, great theologian, said it this way. He said, we trample the blood of the Son of God if we think we are forgiven because we are very sorry for our sins. The only explanation for the forgiveness of God and for the unfathomable depth of his forgetting is the death of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter who or what we are, there is absolute reinstatement into God by the death of Jesus Christ and by no other way, not because Jesus Christ pleads, but because he died. It is not earned, but accepted. Our Lord does not pretend we are all right when we are all wrong. The atonement is a propitiation whereby God, through the death of Jesus, makes an unholy man holy. Are you holy before God? This is what he's done for you. Paul says it really simply, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Jesse preached on it. For our sake, he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's why he died. It was necessary for you and for me. Well, the final thing is the resurrection. Make this really short, because we're out of time. The resurrection. The death is a must, but so is the resurrection. Good Friday is essential to salvation, but what good is salvation is if the guy that provided it is dead? So the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ was part of the plan. It was part of the picture. It was part of what Jesus predicted would happen. It's what the Father did to demonstrate it's all true. You know what the resurrection does? The resurrection says, there. You see, you can be forgiven. That's what the resurrection does. And it says more than that. It says not only can you be forgiven, but now you can eventually have a body like his glorious body, Philippians 3.20.
The resurrection is the seal of approval on all the work that Jesus did, and it's the guarantee of your future and mine. Listen, apart from the resurrection, you don't have a future, and neither do I, other than to live whatever number of years God gives us, and then we're gone and done, and it's all over with. That's all you have to look forward to, except for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the great end to the story, although it's not the end of the story. It's just the beginning of our story. Resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's why he had to be raised as well. Listen, this is the best news the world has ever heard. This is the gospel. This is the good news. There isn't any better news. You can be forgiven. You can have your sins taken away. You can be right with the God who created you even though you violate his character on a daily, minute-by-minute basis. You can be right with him. How's that done? On the basis of the death of Christ. It's like the, per, the, per, the very persuasive lawyer. You know, this, this guy got in trouble and so he got the best lawyer he could find. The lawyer went before the jury and he made his case. And he was so persuasive when the jury came in, they said, they said this, they said, we find the man who stole that horse not guilty. That's what God does for you because of the person of Jesus Christ. He couldn't just do that without payment, do you see? But on the basis of the payment, I declare that person who did that sin, who did that whole raft of sins, who sins constantly in their mind, I declare that person not guilty. To be truly saved, what do you have to do? Nothing except accept the gift. Jesus did it all. It's already done. All we can do is receive it. That's why he had to go to Jerusalem, to suffer, to be rejected, to die, and to rise again. Let's pray. Father, I don't know who's here today that doesn't know you. I'm sure there are some, probably some who think they know you believe because they did some certain act that that got them right with you and of course that can't be true it's only when our heart reaches out and accepts the gift that we have salvation some perhaps who reject any thought that there could be such a thing as penal substitution this is an archaic pagan idea not ever investigating how very different this is from any pagan thoughts about this Some perhaps who just really have never had any real interest in this. Oh, Lord, my prayer this morning is that somehow you will get through to these hearts that, that only your Holy Spirit can get through to and that you will cause us to give ourselves to you who have given everything for us. The cost is great. It was great to the Father. It was great to you. And it will be great to us. Not because we have to do anything, but because we have to give you everything. Lord, what, a, what we get in return makes up for it a million times over. Lord, place it on the heart of anyone who's here without you this morning to just say right now, I want to open my heart to you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me from the inside out. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. Would you do that this morning, I pray. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we close our service by singing together this hymn.